I'm not sure whether the anime was especially good this year or if I'm just experiencing a greater appreciation for the art that I like as I get older. Either way, a lot of people whose opinions I care about say that 2021 was an especially good year for anime. And I agree pretty strongly. I also needed this year to be very strong because this niche channel that only does well when baseball shows are in rotation didn't really have any baseball shows to latch on to this year. But I knew that would be the case heading into 2021, so I decided to broaden my watch list like a proper anti-tuber. Or at least I broadened it as much as I could with a full-time job and a partner and a household to take care of. This required a lot more research than I was initially prepared for, as well as a willingness to stay more plugged in than I have been in years past. And even then, I admittedly watched barely enough shows to make a satisfactory top 10, but I still watched more than I ever have in a given year. We'll get to my top 10 favorite shows soon enough, but I'd like to start off with my favorite anime movies of the year. And though I only watched four anime movies this year, which is barely enough to make a suitable top one, I liked all of them, and so I'd like to shout them all out. One thing I do want to point out before I get started is that I have not watched Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0, so there is a, an Ava-sized hole on this list. You can make of that what you will. It doesn't quite make my top three, but I do want to mention Stranger by the Shore honorably, because while it has a lot of problems with pacing and logic, it's really pretty and the boys are cute and I had a good time watching it. It would make a pretty excellent first movie for a questioning teenager to watch. And for that reason alone, I very much appreciate its existence and wish that I had watched it when I was 15 years old. Another anime that I appreciated more than enjoyed was 2019's Given, which I thought was a cute and fun gay high school romance, but one that I would have enjoyed a lot more had it focused on the two side characters, Aki and Haruki. Well, someone must have listened to me because the Given movie that came out this year, at least in the United States, was basically the show, but focused on the two side characters, Aki and Haruki. And it has everything that I wanted coming from that request, with grad school and adult problems and room sharing situations and more mature emotions coming to the forefront. It was cute seeing our two high schoolers stumble into a relationship, but I found it so much more gratifying to see our two adults essentially going through the same motions but on a much harder difficulty level. I liked this movie quite a bit more than I liked Given, and I liked it quite a bit in general. The movie that I was most looking forward to watching this year, anime or otherwise, was the Shirobako movie that took forever to get here. Shirobako is one of my favorite shows, and I adored the premise of our heroes getting back together to make a movie, and so I bought tickets as early as I could, even though I knew that the theater would be mostly half empty. And I have conflicting feelings about this movie, because while I think the Shirobako movie gave me everything I wanted out of a Shirobako movie, I still left the theater feeling a little underwhelmed. It may have been the virtually unchanging production quality, which looks fine on a small screen, but a little bit underdeveloped on the big screen. But I think it had more to do with me not actually wanting to see Shirobako, but in movie form this time. The thing is though, Shirobako in movie form is still really good. There's a lot of creative ideas from the two musical sequences to this really creative end credit fake out towards the end. And while the entire package is like better than 95% of anime movies, it just doesn't quite hold up to the all-time quality of the show. It's a great movie though, if you like the show, I highly recommend it, it is well worth the wait. I didn't expect to like my favorite movie as much as I did, and I also don't think that this movie is getting the acclaim that it deserves, but I sincerely think that words bubble up like soda pop should be getting the same amount of fanfare as other modern teenage romances like Your Name and A Silent Voice. And I don't think Soda Pop is as good as those movies, but much like Your Name and A Silent Voice, it made me cry for like 20 minutes straight. And uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, that means a lot to me when I appraise media. And I totally get it if the highly saturated colors and the really aggressive art style isn't for you. It even took me about 10 minutes for my brain to be able to process how much information was going on per frame. 
I also get it if you find our characters and our storyline very generic and predictable, especially our main characters. Uh, they're, they're not quite as interesting as their character designs may indicate. But this movie expertly pressed all of my rom-com buttons, especially in the final scene, which is as satisfying a final scene as I've seen in any movie. And uh, that's my movie list. Words Bubble Up Like Soda Pop is number one. And while I tend to enjoy anime movies more than I enjoy televised anime, there were two or three shows that I watched this year that I liked more than anything I watched on the big screen. And we will get into those shows, but first I'd like to talk about the shows that disappointed me the most this year. Now, when I call these shows the most disappointing, I'm not calling them the worst shows of the year, as the worst shows of the year were the ones that I gave 10 minutes to before dropping, but I don't think it's fair to appraise those shows since I didn't finish them. I'm only going to talk about three shows I actually finished that left me feeling a little empty. I understand why people like Horimiya with its interesting character designs and its very unique premise. And there was quite a bit about Horimiya that I liked as well. I liked both the opening and the ending, and I thought easily the best parts of the show were our main characters, Hori and Miyamura. And since interesting main characters are the aspects of a show that I gravitate to the most, Horimiya had a really, really good start for me. But subverting the expectations of a lot of rom-coms that I've watched recently, Horimiya had really interesting main characters and very boring side characters. And once the show ran out of things to do with Hori and Miyamura about halfway through its runtime, it pivots to the side characters with very lackluster results. It didn't help that the show advertised itself as a comedy and is just not funny. I don't think I laughed once during this show, and this show tries really, really hard to make its audience laugh. I stuck with it because there was just enough about it that made it entertaining to follow every week, but I have to stick with my rather unpopular opinion that Horimiya just isn't very good. Now, it is not an unpopular opinion to say that the second season of The Promise Neverland wasn't very good, and while I don't think it was very good, I think I liked it more than most of the fans of the show. Probably because I didn't think the first season was all that great to begin with, and I went into the second season with low expectations, which certainly were not met. I was skeptical about how a second season might look because the horror of the first season relied on the psychological torment of our main character's captivity. And once our heroes escaped, the show all of a sudden had the much more difficult task of building an outside world that was just as horrifying as the one inside the farm. And though I've read testimony from manga readers that the story does that, that is not the case in the show. And that's what made the second season so lackluster by comparison. The world building itself just wasn't very well fleshed out. The Promised Neverland was the worst show that I finished this year, but because I had such low expectations for it, I wouldn't consider it the most disappointing show that I watched this year. That title goes to Nomad, the second season of Megalobox that turned into a really bad clunker of a story after some pretty interesting ideas right out of the gate. I loved the first season of Megalobox for how fresh and retro the art style looked, I really loved the underground hip-hop score, and I really liked its true-to-life depiction of immigration and second-class citizenry in big western cities. And though Nomad starts off by fleshing out some of Megalobox's more interesting points, by the fourth episode it abandons those ideas in favor of chasing something more familiar. And it would be one thing if the something more familiar were just the first season of Megalobox with raised stakes. But the stakes somehow feel lower the second time around. The antagonist feels less imposing and the messaging just hollows out. And Nomad feels worse because it just feels like the first season of Megalobox with lowered stakes. I know Nomad got significant acclaim, at least in my corner of the internet, but this time around I just can't imagine people liking this season as much as the first. Nomad was pretty easily the most disappointed I felt watching anime this year. But from here on out, there is no more disappointment, only a pointment.
television appointment, YouTubing for the appointment anime television. Coming in at number 10 on my list is a show that a lot of people are gonna put at the top of their lists, and that's Sunny Boy. I think the show was rather captivating and emotionally resonant at its bookends, with a first episode that was amongst my favorite viewing experiences of anything that I watched this year, and a final two episodes that I think ultimately rewarded my patience in getting through this show. And I needed a lot of patience because I found just about every episode in between a little too boring to sit through. Even with its avant-garde visuals and loopy timeline and very challenging ideas. I went a little deeper in a Twitter thread that I'll link below, but my main objections to the show were a highly complicated narrative engine that the show still felt the need to consistently explain, and an inexplicably boring main character that doesn't do anything until the final two episodes. Outside of those problems, however, I think Sunny Boy has some pretty interesting narrative ideas about the value of human life in an increasingly bleak 21st century. And though I found much of it a drag, I still consider it a pretty lovely achievement and a worthwhile watch for most people. Number nine on my list is another show that I feel some more different people would put atop their year-end lists, and that is Heike Monogatari. As a big fan of Naoko Yamada's work, I was very excited to see the announcement for this show pop up between the middle of the summer and fall seasons. And with the exception of a couple of other Yamada-adjacent shows that came out this year, there wasn't a show that I was looking forward to watching more this year. And for what it is, I find Heike pretty excellent with some really charming character design and movement, excellent, excellent music, pretty funny gags, and ultimately a beautiful scenery throughout. Like any other Yamada project, I think the sounds this show makes are just as important, if not even more important, than the visual story that it tells. I don't think many people would object to the idea that the entire package of this show's opening and closing themes, score, and sound design is the best that any show produced this season. What holds Heike back for me, however, is its subject matter, as I'm just not as interested in Japanese history as I am in cute girls playing musical instruments. I'm glad that Yamada has branched out and has made something historically significant. It just didn't grab me as much as some of her past projects. It is, in my opinion, Yamada's least essential project, but I completely understand its acclaim and I'm very happy for its success. Number eight is the Slice of Life painting show, which should not be a surprise if you've ever watched this channel. For a show about exploring creative spaces through art, Blue Period is a surprisingly generic looking show. And that's what initially turned me off about this show. But it also slowly sucked me back in week after week with a very quiet and mature outlook on our main character's life. And I left just about every episode thinking, yeah, that was some time well spent. Blue Period has some very strong side characters with excellent motivations, and I think it's at its best when our main character, Yaguchi, is interacting with them. I'm not so interested in his inner monologue, but I think his conversations with other people feel very high school, but also appropriate and very real and resonant. There's a sincere naturalism to this show that I appreciate very greatly, and I think Blue Period is one of the rare shows that gets better with each passing episode. I know the show is basically just a vehicle for a well-received manga that probably wants some more sales, but it's a solidly built vehicle and it's one that makes me maybe want to check out the manga, which is something that I never do. Now we're getting to the shoujo part of the list. This year, I started watching two absurdly colorful shows about young girls trying to break into the professional world of song and dance. One was Love Live, which I dropped, and the other was Kageki Shoujo, which was surprisingly excellent. A lot of people liked Kageki Shoujo, and the reasons why they liked it are the reasons why I liked it as well. 
with the main character Sarasa being larger than life and with the theater kid energy just bouncing from every corner of every frame. It probably could have done a little bit more with the song and dance aspect of the story, though I did appreciate how much I learned about the Takarazuka review. Shows like this that fly by and just end often feel underdeveloped, but this is a show that feels fully developed that just ends rather abruptly. And for that, I have this strange feeling of wanting more. Is this how manga sales work? And now we move on to a show that was at one point this year, the best reviewed show in the history of my anime list, only to be brigaded down to fifth place in a stupid voting process that I don't actually care that much about. And that is Fruits Basket. By this point, probably the most famous shoujo story of all time, though I don't follow these things too closely, so please don't take my word for it. I binged the first two seasons of Fruits Basket in preparation for the third season that came out this year, and I had a perfectly enjoyable time doing it. It hit all of the notes that I expect a popular shoujo series should, and it was interesting enough to hold my attention throughout. But something about the third season pressed all of my buttons even more than the first two did. Maybe it was because it was shorter and tighter than the first two seasons with much less filler boring me throughout. Or maybe it was because it came to a very, very satisfying conclusion that I, I was pulling for, to be honest. Fruits Basket was the most generic show I watched this year that I still enjoyed. And even though I'm not the target audience, I very much understand the hype now. And uh, now we get into my top five, where we begin with a show that had no right to be as excellent as it was with such a generic looking art style and lazy premise, and that is My Senpai is Annoying. I only gave it a shot because it looked like an adult romantic comedy, and I've spent a lot of time over the years watching shows like Wotokoi, and I can't understand what my husband is saying, and I thought that this show would be similar. I didn't really care for the boy big, girl small premise of it all, but I figured it was worth ignoring just to give it a shot. And uh, not only is this show better than Wotokoi, and I can't understand what my husband is saying, it's a... Uh, it's, it's my favorite romantic comedy of the year. This show's plot and characters don't do anything special or different, and goodness knows this show should not stand out against its peers. But what I especially like about this show is that it's so easy to understand why our two main characters are into each other, because it's so easy to fall in love with them from our perspective. Futaba is so driven by her desire to overcome her tiny stature, and Harumi uses his massive size to take care of everyone around him. Of course this match is perfect, why wouldn't I want to watch 12 episodes of this? And I understand the criticism that this show focuses a bit too much on the romantic pairing of our side characters more than it does our main characters, especially towards the end of the show. But what makes this show so much more lovable than something like Horimiya, which does something similar, is that our side characters are just as lovable as our main characters. I definitely wanted to see more romantic development from our main characters Harumi and Futaba, but I certainly didn't mind watching it from our side characters Sakura and Kazuma. This show does so much with what little it has going for it, and it felt like such joyful relief to be distracted by this show for half an hour once a week. One low effort, high reward rom-com every year is all that I ask for. Number four on this list is a show that I was able to binge while recovering from the effects of a COVID vaccine, and that was SK Infinity Sign, or Skate the Infinity, as I had to type in to Funimation because the show was way too difficult to find in the onset. I have to take this time to admit my sincere love for Southern California skateboarding culture. I was terrible at skateboarding as a child, but I grew up surrounded by people who loved to skate. And so of course I listened to surf punk and I played Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and I watched Lords of Dogtown like 10 times and I wore Vans as a kid. And Skate the Infinity is the amalgamation of all of that, plus it's also colorful and very, very gay. 
It is my kind of show, and I wouldn't have been able to tell you that before I even knew this existed. I honestly don't know how small the middle of the Venn diagram has to be to fit all of the people who would be interested in this show, but I'm in that space, and they absolutely nailed it. The visuals on this show are lively and intense and completely engrossing whether you're watching an action scene or just two people at a skate shop chatting. I felt like I was watching Free. I felt like I was watching Hunter Hunter. I felt like I was playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I have such good memories of doing all three and I'm so glad that I have another piece of the skateboarding puzzle to add into my collection of appreciation. Skate the Infinity is an easy 9 out of 10, and though I've never really seen anything like this before, uh, more shows like this, please. Speaking of 9 out of 10s, my third favorite show of the year is also a 9 out of 10, and just missed out on being a 10 out of 10 for some small complaints that I had. And that show is Odd Taxi. I talked at length about Odd Taxi in my spring review video, and so if you want some more detail, you can hit that up. But the gist of my feelings about Odd Taxi are that my heart breaks every single time that I think about this show. It's so real and tragic and makes me hate the big city just as much as I never want to leave the big city. All of the characters are so rich and dense, despite all of them falling into their predestined roles in this puzzle of a mob story. And they're funny enough to hit you with just enough black comedy to get you through all of the truly horrifying bits. And this show is pretty horrifying, pretty often. It's the single best crime drama I have ever watched. And I'm not gonna claim to be like a fan of crime dramas or mob movies or anything, but I have seen my fair share of shows and movies and this one's better than all of them. It's, uh, it's definitely not for kids, but if you're in your mid 20s or above, then uh, yeah, yeah, please go watch Odd Taxi. I tweeted earlier this summer that Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid is a perfect show. And if you disagree, then you're just not old enough yet. I stand by that because while I think that Dragon Maid has some appeal for children and can certainly be viewed as a kid's show, all of the best stuff from the show is something that can only be appreciated by someone who has done at least some adulting in their life. I think this season of Dragon Maid is the best looking seasonal that Kyoto Animation has ever put out. I think the storylines were more mature and thought-provoking than they were in the first season, and I think everything about this second season was better than everything about the first season, with the exception of the opening, and even then, just like marginally so. I know a lot of people were very worried about Ilulu's inclusion into the ensemble, but I really like what a lazy teenager does to the found family dynamic of our dragons. I especially loved how much attention Quetzal or Lukoa got in this show because she is my favorite dragon and probably the best girl the entire year for me. I also loved how much development we got from Elma and Doru's backstory as it really dug deep into the weird dynamics of adult friendships. But what I like most about this season is how much it emphasized how truly special a person Gobayashi is. We need more shows about how regular people can turn in to absolute heroes by doing basic good deeds, and Kobayashi is the best out of all of them. Dragon Maid is a perfect show, and you cannot extract a single bit of criticism about it from me. I, I can't think of it. There, there's nothing bad about this show. Nothing. I, it, nothing. I will remain obstinate to that because in a few moments I might need to do a little more defending for my favorite show of the year. Which, without further ado, is I've been killing slimes for 300 years and I've maxed out my l uh, I'm kidding, it's Wonder Egg. The discourse around Wonder Egg priority this year was so negative and entitled that 
I felt very frustrated trying to prop up this show's merits at certain points throughout the year. And when I needed motivation to write about my abundant feelings about this show, despite virtually everyone else's abundant negativity, all I really needed to do was to bring up a clip, any clip really of Wonder Egg, and I was instantly reminded, oh yeah, this is one of the greatest shows I have ever seen. I understand that is not a popular opinion and this show left a lot of people rightly or wrongly disappointed. I'm not here to say those feelings or thoughts are invalid and I've already made several Twitter threads and a couple of videos outlining my defenses of this show. Basically I recognize that people who don't like this show have some valid points and it's not going to dissuade me from knocking it off the top spot of my list. Wonder Egg Priority was my favorite show of the year, no questions asked. I love me some great character animation and compositing. I love gay shit. I love great scores. I love emotionally broken characters fighting for redemption. I realize this is a weird thing, but I also love stories about characters fighting and fighting and continuing to struggle and reaching the finish line and not discovering what they thought they were going to feel. That is real and it is extremely my shit. Especially if the fighting itself is actual violent fighting. I love unjustified resolutions, even though I can understand why a lot of people wouldn't. Most of all, I just loved I, Momoe, Rika and Nehru, and I cherished every minute I spent with this ensemble. I in no way think that Wonder Egg Priority is a perfect show, but over the years, I have come to adopt the principle that my favorite things are not necessarily the things that do the least bad, but the things that do the most good. Every episode of Wonder Egg Priority overflows with stuff that I love and that easily negates all of the things that I found a bit questionable or unsatisfying. Shows like Wonder Egg Priority are the reason why I continue with this medium and I will continue loving this show for a long time probably despite all of the negativity surrounding it. And that was 2021, a fairly shit year with a lot of remarkable shows and movies to its name. Here's to hoping that 2022 is just as fruitful.